From time to time, we have a new speaker that has uh, made it through the gauntlet of uh, Call for Papers. And um, they've been sort of vetted. And um, we, we really appreciate their effort and their work and their research and their, their uh, there's a lot of work. And we, we really want to congratulate our new speakers for making it through and for having the guts and figuring it out for the first time. It go, it's all down from here. <laughs> so um, give Josh Mitchell a big round of applause. Cheers. I think that makes four. I'm sorry. Um, so Josh is here to talk about uh, some critical issues with police body cameras and ride along adventures. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Oh. Welcome. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, yes, I have to have this up front. <laughs> you guys can read that. Okay. So here's uh, some of the things we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to go with a little bit of an introduction, say hi to everybody. Um, let's talk about some of the technology um, involved in these devices. Uh, I have five specific models to talk about. Um, I had seven, but due to circumstances out of my control, I can only talk about five. Uh, and then we'll cover some industry-wide issues that I think apply to uh, all of the devices. Uh, have some, see some impact that's kind of important, and then have some questions. So here, this is me, and yes, that is a hamburger phone. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing this for quite a while, uh, former military. Um, then, oh. uh, spe I specialized in uh, electronic warfare, uh, but then got into doing a little bit of malware stuff because it's fun. Uh, and then I became a professional exploit developer for a, a number of years, and now I do security research uh, at Nuix. So, <clears throat> there are Approximately, I've, I've categorized 77 different devices um, out there in the wild. Uh, uh, you have the big ones, Panasonic, Motorola, uh, Patrol Eyes. Now these, these devices, they have uh, a wide variety of technology um, kind of forced into them. Uh, it's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, some support NFC. Uh, some devices have um, triggers, event, event triggers you can use. Um, some do live streaming direct over GSM. Uh, those are really popular in Europe. And other ones have uh, proprietary RF communications and they ride along. Uh, they, they, they piggyback on the, the walkabout radios that uh, police are using. Right, and it's very important to note that these devices were primarily designed for transparency versus secrecy, although that may be um, a bit of a vendor line uh, because of some of the issues that I've found. And we'll play a little, little game, uh, feature versus vuln, um, as we go through this presentation. So. Right, again, um, so these devices, they, they interact um, th they have an entire ecosystem surrounding them. It's not just the camera, which I'll show you more about this one later. Um, it's, they, they, have, they have desktop software. Um, some of them use uh, blended uh, storage. So you have on-site storage, you have cloud repositories. Um, some even have uh, dedicated uh, docking stations that use um, an embedded Linux distro and they create like an IPsec tunnel back to a cloud repository. Um, and uh, most of the ones that are interesting um, have smartphone applications that allow, uh, that allow officers in the field to annotate uh, videos uh, and review the contents of the camera, which we'll get into later, it's quite bad. Um, so this is the first, 
first device uh, I kind of started looking at um, back in January. Um, and uh, it's, it's sold on Amazon. Anyone can go and, and buy it, pick it up. Um, it's sold under this, the CEESC people, but uh, Advanced Plus is actually the manufacturer of the device. Um, and they're, they're located in China. Uh, and I uh, wanted to mention really quick, I did get in contact with the vendor, and they have given me firmware and desktop, uh, desktop application, uh, but I didn't get a, a chance to review it because it happened uh, last week. So anyways, um, so this, uh, this particular device um, got it, took it apart, took the remote apart, trying to figure out how the remote is, is interacting with the, the camera, um, and... Uh, you know, had to, had to go and look at some chips and see what, what frequency it's operating. It's actually 433, uh, and RTL 40, 433 identifies it as a smoke detector, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the, the neat thing about the remote and why I wanted to get these, this device is because um, the remote uh, can be used to trigger multiple different cameras, not just one. You, you can actually um, update the remote so that it, it triggers like a wide variety of cameras. Um, and so we can kind of be annoying with that because this is the simple signal that's being transmitted. It's, uh, there's no rolling codes, there's none of that. Um, so if you want to, you can, you can sit there with a RTL SDR, receive the signals, you replay it with something more powerful than a hack RF because, well, it doesn't have much power. Um, uh, the other interesting thing about this device is when I was getting in contact with the manufacturer, um, they told me about their RF certification and it was not FCC certified. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, another thing about it is, is it's essentially um, a USB drive. So anything that you have uh, you know, when it records the videos, it drops them down onto the, the, the dedicated storage on the device. You plug it in to your computer. Uh, you pull the, the things off just like a, a, a USB storage. So if I wanted to put autorun.inf or <laughs> take advantage of some link vulnerabilities that have been popular in the past, uh, that's completely possible with this camera. All right, so here's another, another camera. This is the... Uh, on call OCP Pro. Um, uh, so you see the architecture of the system uh, down there in big. Uh, but un unfortunately, uh, because of the one I got, um, nothing really worked. <laughs> uh, so I, I got it. Um, it, it. I think the USB was broken. It wouldn't, it wouldn't maintain a USB connection. Um, so everything to the uh, to, to your, your right of the arrows, I didn't get a chance to test out. Uh, but there were enough glaring issues um, on the other part that it's fun to talk about. Um, it uses an RTOS called ECOS. Uh, that's, um, hasn't, there, there hasn't been very many updates on that, that particular um, website in, in quite a while. Uh, when you trigger the Wi-Fi on it through a button press, um, it comes up as Firecam, and that is the default password. Uh, and yes, and, and it, it has a, uh, has an <clears throat> a wonderful um, embedded ECOS HTTP server um, that I thought would be fun to kind of poke at, but you'll see that it wasn't really necessary. Um, Yes, so, so this is the contents of the, uh, the movie folder. Um, and you see the, all the videos. It, it's coming up as 2014 because, again, it never got a good time sync from my, from my laptop. Um, but these are all the saved videos, and you see you can remove them, download them, upload files. Um, you can actually even uh, upload arbitrary HTML and serve that in the browser. That's not good. <clears throat> um, yeah, so totally unprotected, 100%. No, nothing, 
nothing at all preventing anyone from downloading these videos or uploading ones and um, ones to uh, kind of overwrite these. Um, and uh, I have uh, uh, wrote some tools that use Git and Post um, to overwrite files and download all of the contents. Um, it also has a, uh, a nice settings file uh, that um, you can download as well that has all of the relevant information about the camera in it, which is interesting. Okay, so here's the, the first kind of big device, uh, widely kind of used uh, device that I had, had a chance to, to look at. So this, this particular device has, has, a smart, it has a smartphone application that you can go and download on, available on the Play Store. Um, it has desktop software that is, is available for download on the manufacturer or the, the reseller's website. And I say reseller because we will, we will show, I'll show you this in a moment. Uh, and the firmware is also available for anyone to go ahead and pull down and browse and look through because it's not signed and it's not encrypted, which is awesome. Uh, right, so smartphone application is primarily used to access the RTSP server that is not protected from anyone. Uh, and um, you can view the saved videos on the device. And the, the desktop software is, is used to, um, to authenticate with the camera uh, and, and download the video files off of the camera. So uh, the desktop software, as you see there, is the, it's, simple, it's a simple um, wrapper around the DMT10.dll. Um, and that is, uh, actually the, the name of that comes, I think comes from um, the Chinese manufacturer because they sell the DMT10 version of this camera. Uh, the admin and general user passwords are uh, six characters. They have to be exactly six characters. No more or no less. Um, it has the SSID, as you see, for AMBA boss. Uh, and, and that's not something that you can change. And I'll, I'll get into that, why that's, that's kind of a big deal later. Um, and you have some other things you can, can mess with. And this is the administrative interface. Um, as with all of the other desktop software that I have looked at. Um, it's missing a lot of the uh, exploitation prevention mechanisms like ASLR. Uh, um, and that, that's kind of across the board. Uh, you see here this little, bit, little clip from Ida. Uh, the verify password um, routine um, coming from DMT10. Uh, and then you have the set password uh, export that's called from, uh, that's available in DMT10 as well. Uh, you can see there, there's no correlation between the two. That means that I can set the password without having to verify the password. Yeah, so that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Again, it comes with a smartphone application. If you want to go find it, there, there it is. Uh, and that is primarily used to um, view, save videos, and live stream whatever the, the camera is looking at. Um, and the, uh, I want to be sure to, to mention all of these cameras, except I think for the next one, uh, when you activate the Wi-Fi on these devices, they, um, they create a access point, right? They act as, as a Wi-Fi like hotspot without internet connectivity. Um, so. Uh, so that, that's kind of important because if anyone's wanting to review videos, they create a, essentially a beacon upon themselves that uh, anyone can kind of find and play with. And we'll talk more about that part later. Um, right, so again, this, this device, um, it's running a little bit of an older version of Linux. That's, that's not really bad. Um, Again, it has, it has a, a JSON messaging server, which I was really surprised about, um, and RTSP and, and DNS. And, and after, um, after uh, I got to poke around on the system, I found out that it was incredibly sim similar to um, a talk GoPro or Get the Fuck Out. Um, 
that uh, if you want to know anything more about how this system operates, I would uh, really recommend going reading and looking through that because it has a lot, um, it goes to a lot in depth about the messaging subsystem. Um, and I wish I would have found that out, right, <laughs> when I was looking at this. But uh, I didn't need to because it has root telnet exposed with no password required. <laughs> and I, I wrote a wrapper script around PyTelnet that allows you to upload and download files if you don't feel like using Telnet. Um, again, here's the contents of the, the uh, media, um, yeah, the, the media folder. So any videos that you make are so saved into here. Um, this directory is mounted when you use the desktop software um, to download and upload videos. Um, and it, it essentially sends a, a, a trigger to the camera uh, and we can then like it, it treats it as a, as a removable media drive. So yeah, if you wanted to upload, again, link files or any type of Windows-based exploits um, to take advantage of the back-end digital evidence storage repository where these videos will be saved and, you know, have something nice like WannaCry, um, you could definitely do that. Uh, what, yeah, so. There we go. So this is um, uh, this device, the Digital Ally First View HD, is architecturally different than all of the other cameras. Um, it treats it, it is a client, okay, and it has other devices in its ecosystem that uh, that act as servers. For example, the um, the rear view mirror in a cop car will act as a Wi-Fi access point. When this device is within range, it will automatically connect to that Wi-Fi access point and then, um, you know, interact uh, through that. It's also how if you're able, if you turn on the sirens, uh, it will automatically start recording. It has event triggers, that kind of technology. Uh, and again, it's, it supports, has its own desktop software that I tried to purchase three month, or two months ago and I did not get, which is unfortunate. It has a smartphone application that anyone can download. Uh, firmware is available and easy to look through. Literally, Tar will unpack the firmware. Uh, and it ha does have a, a docking station um, that you, know, you can you take the camera out and plug it in and it will download stuff. Um, but interestingly enough, it does come with a minimal software bundle um, on the device for anyone who, who gets a hold of it and wants to uh, minimum configuration manager and the minimum software viewer to, uh, to view the contents and, and um, see whatever's going on on the device. You can also, um, it also has uh, like, uh, read me's on there about how the device is supposed to work. So that's very, very user friendly and kind of nice. Um, so here is a picture of the, uh, um, the minimum, the, like the, the minim, minimal viewer that comes packaged on the device, right? Uh, the software view vault I tried to purchase um, and will hopefully it will get here eventually because there's a lot of features that I wasn't able to um, interact with and, and play around with because I didn't have that. Uh, one of those main features being you turn the, you turn the device into a wireless client, right? I couldn't, I couldn't do that because you have to pay the $800 for the desktop software. Um, but we were still, we were still able to, um, get some good stuff out of it. So the, uh, the packaged installer is written in C sharp, which is awesome because it's really easy to uh, decompile and play around with. Um, the configuration manager uh, generates two types of files, the one WM config, and that's for wireless. Uh, it also generates the device config, and that is a binary format that's, um, that you can uh, use to set the time and stuff like that. Now, the, uh, the viewer, 
um, which is used for evidence review and making comments and, and uh, clipping videos and stuff, generates three types of files. The DAS file, which is the digital ally zip file. Uh, the metadata file and the VM2 file, which is XML. Uh, and we will go into those right now. So the WM config file is quite interesting because it is something that you're supposed to generate through the configuration uh, software and then put on the device. And it configures the device on how to interact with uh, police networks and police um, like systems, right? So that would be important. So that would n not be a good thing to have that uh, XOR as, as the way to decode it. Uh, and you can see here that the, it's configured to use the, uh, to look for the, the SSID that is associated with the police network. It has the PSK um, that is just hex encoded uh, and the password for FTP logins um, so that it can upload and download whatever media is on the device as it goes. Um, then the, the device config file is again to, um, to insert time and other information onto the device. Uh, that um, has a couple lines worth of an XOR, but it basically is an equivalent to uh, hex 88 XOR. So that's, that's cool. Oh, and um, the 001 is before, and then the small one is after when you decode it uh, with, with XOR. Uh, here's the DAS file. The DAS file is generated through the viewer application when you, you have, so you have the, the AVI and the metadata file. You insert that into the viewer application and then you mess around with, vi with the video and you save it out and it creates this DAS file and all this other stuff. Um, the, the VM2 file here is included in the, in the zip file. Uh, and it, you see it has a, a huge amount of metadata associated with how this, this camera was operating um, and how, um, you know, like what sensors were used, what's the GPS cords, all of this kind of stuff, right? And you see here it uses AES-128-CBC and the file name is the decryption key. <laughs> see here. We have, like in, in this, we would have D0018002, and then we just basically make that Unicode, and we have the IV and the decryption key for our AES, uh, whatever. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> right, so since, uh, since Digital Ally was so nice to include an unsigned installer on their application, uh, I thought it would be fun to um, insert a backdoor into that because I can overwrite it, download it, modify it, push it back, overwrite it, and then if anybody wants to install it, they, they give me a nice shell. Uh, so uh, you see here at the um, top item, that's the normal entry point. I just hand jammed this assembly and all that does is that creates a thread on the, uh, on the section that I added to the application and that section is oh no's. Uh, and then underneath I uh, simply put in some Metasploit reverse shell shellcode. And this is the, uh, here we have the install shield uh, and down here we have the shell uh, that's generated. I had to cut a lot of videos so for time, but so that's really bad. <laughs> right, so um, again, the, the Android application, which you can download on the Play Store, um, is used to uh, basically use the configuration manager and you sideload config files onto it, and that will turn your, your phone into, um, into an access point that the camera can then talk to. Now, I was hoping that after two months I would get the software that I purchased. Uh, and so I didn't bother to reverse engineer it on fr with Frida, um, but I might have to soon or get my money back. I don't know. <laughs> right. So again, uh, here is the firmware that you can get from the, 
from, from the manufacturer. Um, again, a bin walk and tar is really all you need. Um, but as you're going through the, uh, the firmware, because once, once it gets extracted, it has some, some really interesting, uh, interesting things going on in there um, that I think I'm going to put in version two of this talk. There's some serious unbounded memory copy operations going on. Uh, but anyways, uh, if, if you don't um, want to uh, uh, debug anything running on the device, if you create a neat, nice little log file on the, on the, the camera, um, it creates every, after every operation here, we have this, this log stuff going on after every, in every function. It generates that. So there's tons of logging information and stuff. And all you have to do is create the log file and it's good to go. Uh, the GUI application in the MDVR, mobile DVR, I'm pretty sure what that means, uh, is what's used to do all of this interesting stuff. And it does some really interesting stuff because there's lots of Wi Fi triggers and peer to peer operations going on with all of these devices when they're within the same network. Uh, and there's a lot of unbounded memory copying operations going on on these devices in their peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll save that for the next version. Ah, this guy. I wanted to spend some time on this because um, this camera is used uh, uh, in some pretty big um, uh, in some pretty big departments. Uh, again, it has, it has the smartphone application. It has the awesome desktop software. Uh, it even has docking station and, and it sports cloud storage. And you can get the firmware. Um, and they try they tried to be uh, have a pretty professionalized uh, operation. Um, again, smartphone for live streaming and viewing media, which we'll talk about later. And uh, desktop software for actually verifying that the media files that are coming from the device are valid. And we'll talk about that later too. So here's the desktop software. It is a fat client, right? So essentially you have a SQL database install and then you have some two fat clients for admin, one for admin and one for officers, right? Uh, and it's used to, um, the admin app is used to configure the cameras and then assign them to, to, to various officers. Uh, and then the client application is used to upload, download video, uh, and, and that's essentially it, right? You can add comments, but really at uploading, downloading videos from the cameras, exporting them from the, the, the fat client is essentially it. Um, but another application that is installed with this is the import export tool. Um, and there's, there's two types of authentication going on here. You have the authentication and the passwords that are created for, through the admin app that, is, that are used to uh, interact with the, the software and with the, the contents of the database. Now, then you have the uh, Windows authentication mechanism, which is actually used by the import export tool to authenticate with the database, bypassing all of the uh, uh, vView at auth and use a straight uh, Windows auth. So if I am local admin somewhere out there on a desktop that, is that the officer is using the client app to upload and download videos, I can then connect and uh, export videos. But I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, other things associated with this, we have, um, we have lots of the install folders. It kind of spreads out everywhere when you install it on your, on your box. Um, and we have logs about the, the, uh, the communication between your computer and this device. Um, it communicates over uh, USB, creates a COM serial over USB, uh, attaches to the, the uh, file, and then starts writing stuff out to it. Um, it also uh, has, has uh, downloaded metadata, that, like downloaded videos are cached on the computers. So uh, <laughs> bypass, down, you have access to the downloaded metadata by bypassing the 
upload client by just looking into the, the correct folder. Um, yeah, and, and again, if you go there, you can see all the cached videos. Yeah, so domain credentials, what I was kind of talking about earlier, uh, are used to export the database instead of the application credentials that you use when you uh, create users. Um, and that is the uh, admin user, super, for a supervisor, I suppose. Uh, and that's the SHA-1 of 123456, which is the default password uh, for all of the uh, admin, um, yeah, for the, for the supervisor, for the admin interface, right? Um, and they, they try to, when you install this, we start it up, but this is how I found it. Uh, it requires you, they asks you to, to contact their help and support system to configure the desktop software. Really, it's so that they can upsell you, right? So I was like, well, no, I don't want to do that um, because it probably wouldn't be good having Josh at his house contact the support people. Um, and, and so I was clicking around and found the import export tool and Googled the password. Uh, and, and then I was able to have admin on their software, which also you have to buy. So. Uh, Ah, another issue with this is when you download videos off of the camera, um, you, it, it, uh, you, can, you can play those videos through the interface, right? Through, the, through the, uh, um, the admin or the client interface, you can review the videos. Um, and to do that, it comes bundled with FFmpeg. Uh, and um, it also uses FFmpeg to uh, to create thumbnails based on the video. So not only when you just play the video does it use FFmpeg, uh, but when you, uh, when you upload all of the videos at, at the time of upload, it uses this to create thumbnails of the videos, which is important because it's processing videos with a version of FFmpeg that is from 2014 and has over 122 public CVEs of, out there for this version of FFmpeg. So if I could modify those version, those videos beforehand, insert an exploit, I know I have a really, really vulnerable piece of software that's gonna process those videos, which would then give me, uh, gain me access to the evidence storage repository where these, these videos are stored. Ah, so here we have the, the admin interface um, of the, of the Vera Patrol software. Uh, and you see here we have, we have several videos that have been uploaded by supervisor and their durations are you know, in there and they have valid digital signatures. Uh, and then we have over, over here, we have making a copy of the video and exporting it and stuff. And there's an important video that we need to look at right there. It has a time length of zero and a valid digital signature. So as we export these AVI files from the interface, uh, we, have, we, you know, we just pick, a, pick an output folder and it creates the AVI file and then it has the log file that, uh, that requires all the comments put in there. Uh, and it saves them to wherever you want. And again, it says this file has a valid digital signature. A valid digital signature. So this is the contents of that AVI file that has a valid digital signature. That holds up in a court of law, right? That is used to prosecute people and put them in jail. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll show you how I did that uh, in a moment. Again, so we have the interaction uh, with this, this device. Um, it has, uh, you know, we create our, lo it has log files that are nice and kind of can peruse through those. Uh, it uses serial communications over USB uh, to upload, download files, update firmware, uh, and do all that kind of nice fancy stuff. Well, the other day when I noticed when I was downloading those files, which were quite big, uh, it actually just tells the device to mount, uh, uh, this, the, the application just tells the device to mount itself as a 
removable media drive. And then downloads the files. So if, if you want to write an application to interact with this, we see that, that the command system is incredibly complex right here. Uh, and very difficult to modify. And we can see right here that the device gets mounted as the E drive. Uh, and then it begins to upload the files. So as I see this random drive pop up on my computer, I'm like, oh, what's in E? Let me, let me open that. And then you can just download the files off of that, completely bypassing all of the evidence collection software. This is awesome. Uh, right, again, so we have the, the uh, smartphone application um, that is supposed to interact with this device in the field. Um, and it uploads metadata to each of the video based off uh, with JSON, which is pretty standard. Uh, you can also download any file off of this device, right? So, uh, and then you can live stream uh, with RTSP. So, the only thing you need to do is if, if you found one of these in the wild is download the app and you can see anything on it. Also, if you're within proximity of some police officers and you'd like to see what they see, you can see, you can see that over RTSP. Um, there were some pretty good talks a little while ago about the Sun Plus format. Uh, and there are some tools out there that I definitely use that converts the Sun Plus uh, firmware burn format to, uh, to IDB, IDB, which is great. Uh, it's freaking awesome. You should check that out. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so you don't have to unpack, or unpack firmware or do anything like that. It's just ready, good to go. Now, this device has several services that are available on it, and it is this one right here. Uh, uh, it has FTP, uh, has the photo transfer protocol, and it has RTSP. Uh, FTP is used for uploading, downloading files. It's also used for, with the smartphone, uh, it's used to you know, upload uh, and download metadata. So you can download any video off the device. You can also assign um, you know, any type of metadata through the JSON interface. Now, for you to be able to get um, uh, for, for the smartphone to get a directory listing of which files are available, uh, it uses the photo transfer protocol, which um, there's some really great Git repos out there about using PTP over Wi-Fi. Um, and that's going to be important in a minute. And then, of course, RTSP, which, you know, you just use VLC. So if I wanted to see what all the... What all the uh, video that was stored on this device. You simply use PTP. Uh, and we can see here that we have some AVI files that were filled with A's earlier, uh, available in our PTP directory listing. Now, for us to interact with that incredibly sophisticated uh, FTP software and overwrite files that should be digitally signed and used to uh, put people in jail, uh, we use FTP and we have some passwords, Wi-Fi cam and username Wi-Fi cam. It actually accepts any combination. <laughs> so if you don't remember Wi-Fi cam, you can try any other combination and it will work. Uh, then we have, uh, we, we just use type one and then we, uh, we enter pass, passive mode. I was playing around here trying to delete video files. It wouldn't let me delete uh, pre-existing video files, but it would let me overwrite them with whatever I wanted. And that is how we got A uh, in that digitally signed valid evidence file from earlier. Okay, so we have like a little demo. We'll show you here. Let's turn this guy on. Cool. It's on. All right. So another thing that I, I wrote um, was a tool to uh, identify these cameras in the wild based on their MAC addresses and their wireless access points. Because I said I was in the military and I, I think a, a very, very important yet often overlooked thing uh, is the ability to, to locate something <coughs> uh, like in the field 
and be able to identify the emitter with the platform, the platform being the police and the emitter being the camera. Uh, and if I know that vView, I go and look in the OUI database and I see the MAC addresses that are associated with this company that is published by the IEEE uh, and I can say that this company only makes cameras and if I pick up a MAC address or a SSID that's associated with that, well, guess what it's only going to be? It's only going to be this, right? And uh, as a bad guy, you might want to know that, right? Maybe find out about cops running around in our area. Let's see if this is working. I don't know. Yep, live demos, ass. Let's see if it's connected. Okay. You'll see. Okay, yeah, there it is right there. Let's see if my buggy software works. No, it's not working right now. Oh well, this is a two part demo. <laughs> right, so everybody knows that like USB, Wi Fi, and Linux is shit. It's been the story of my life trying to get one interface that works right. Uh, but anyways, uh, if you wanted, it's supposed to identify this guy right here that we see. Uh, and we can just connect to that. Um, and the password is 12345678901. It's very complicated. <coughs> anyways, so here, um, again, no, nothing really protecting uh, anything that's going on. We'll just go ahead and we can just use VLC. It's that easy. Takes a while. Ta da! Hi, DEF CON. Hey. So, again, again, feature. Feature, right? This is a, this is a feature that is awful, right? Anybody that would be like, yeah, I would like to live stream some video off of a police officer whenever I want. That's a feature. Oh, and the manufacturers like to say that, uh, oh, it's only supposed to be right here. Yeah, because Wi-Fi antennas can't pick up stuff from a mile away. Like, that hasn't been proven years ago, right? Okay. And, and we can change the default password on this to give it something very complex because crack doesn't exist. And neither does that Wi-Fi uh, thing the other day, where um, you could you could get the the key without even needing a client on the WPA2 uh, uh, network. If you guys haven't read that, I highly encourage doing it. Okay, so where's my presentation? Come back. All right, here we are. Bang. Okay, so cool. Industry-wide issues. Right, so I analyzed many cameras. I can talk about five. Uh, and an industry-wide issue is digital signatures are not applied to the multimedia coming off of the device before it touches anything else. Which means that if anyone is able to get in between that, being either being on the desktop or interacting with the device in the field, you can corrupt any kind of evidentiary information on that device. And that is supposed to stand up in a court of law and put people in jail. Again, unencrypted firmware, unsigned firmware, l l unsigned. Your smartphone signs this firmware, right? That, how much does that cost? How much do these things cost? About the same, right? Uh, so you can peruse, you see anything you want. If you have physical access to the device, you could roll your own malware, drop it on there, and then as soon as it gets synced back in the back end, you own them. Done. Three minutes? Okay, cool. Uh, and again, localization, being able to find stuff out there. I war walk, find cops. Cool? Why it's important? Uh, because this happened here last year, right? And the guy had cameras in the hallways and he was targeting police. If he knew about this, he'd be able to do that a lot better. Okay, thanks. Thanks to Saha and everyone in the Basement Broadhead. Uh, New XCTAC. Cool.
And I think I think I have a couple minutes. I got questions. I got time for questions. Like one, one question. What time is it? It's Team Grime time time. <laughs> yes. Some do, some don't. Some you can actually configure to always be on the Wi-Fi. Always have Wi-Fi on. Some use Bluetooth. No, oh, this doesn't show anything. It's just on. It's still connected to my laptop. Yeah. I have, but it's very difficult to get any response at all back, and they don't publish who, uh, you know, who they're selling these things to. Except for the like NYB, the, you can go to these guys' websites. They have a couple of their big contracts on there. Yeah, they won't even send you the software you purchased. No, they won't even send me the software I bought. <laughs> so cool. Oh, yeah.